Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Eborn and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and participating in the third of our Ask the Experts webinar series on vision screening. In today's webinar, Mary Ellen Barkman will talk about how the Pinellas County School District, with a student population of over 100,000, helps reduce undiagnosed vision disorders and prevents blindness in their schools. She'll also discuss how a large percentage of their students are covered by Medicaid, which allows Pinellas County Schools to ensure that students who were referred have the means to be seen by an eye care specialist and receive glasses if necessary. Before I turn the time over to Mary Ellen, I'd like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. We will not be taking any audio questions, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface and go to webinar. You can submit your questions anytime during the presentation. Mary Ellen is planning to take about 45 minutes for her presentation, after which uh, she will answer questions in the order uh, in which they were received. We are going to record this webinar and a link to it will be provided to everyone who has registered for the webinar today. We will email uh, the link to all of you within a few days of, uh, of today's presentation. Everyone who attends the, the presentation today will also be receiving a certificate of attendance for joining us today. And you will receive that certificate on the same email as the recorded link. Um, and that will again be within a few days, three to four business days of our presentation. And lastly, if you're having any technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please call GoToWebinar directly at 855-352-9003. Again, that number for GoToWebinar is 855-352-9003. And now we'll turn the time over to Mary Ellen. Well, hello everyone. My name is Mary Ellen Barkman and I am the presenter today. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I, I grew up in Rhode Island. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Rhode Island, and I have my master's degree actually in physical therapy. I came to Florida. I met my husband here, and uh, we have three beautiful children, and we love Florida. So um, just to give you some background, I also have some specialty areas. Um, one of the things that I specialized in is in vestibular imbalance disorders, and I actually worked, um, I was one-on-one -on -one with a neuro-ophthalmologist. He specialized in neurology and ophthalmology. He had a dual um, medical degrees in each one of those. So I started off really looking um, about how the eyes affected the movement, and, but, and coming into the schools, I understand how important vision is to being able to be successful in an academic environment. So. That's a little bit of background about me. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, today is a day, special day for me. My, uh, it was my grandmother's birthday and my grandmother was also a nurse. So I know that today is Happy Nurses Day. So uh, it means a lot to me because I have a personal connection. Obviously my grandmother, I saw her go to the hospital every day and, and um, we were very close. So I appreciate immensely what nurses do. I work with them in the hospital settings, I work with them in rehab, and of course I work with them in the schools. And I just wanted to say that, you know, all the kindness and careness you give to others, it'll come back to warm your heart twofold. I know it will. So happy Nurses Day to all those nurses out there. Um, that being said, I wanted to start today with talking a little bit about um, the American Academy of Ophthalmology says that back to school vision screenings are vital to a child's success in the classroom. So, you know, what does that mean for us, right? Because we're, we're out there every day doing what we need to do. According to Medicaid.gov, which again, I'm the Medicaid coordinator now for the district, um, and so I get a lot of my statistics from them, that about one quarter of school age children have a significant vision problem. So what does that mean? One out of every four children that you see in a classroom is having some sort of significant vision problem where they need some intervention. Pretty scary statistics when you think about it. Um, 
And again, according to Medicaid.gov, too few children receive the vision screenings that they need and that common visual problems go untreated. So childhood conditions such as nearsightedness, lazy eye, or strabismus, those are things that we can intervene at an earlier time. The, close, the earlier we intervene, the better the child's success rate is. One of the scariest things that when I was doing some research here, it was interesting because, you know, amblyopia, which we'll talk about on the next screen, um, is one of the most common reasons for monocular vision loss for, for people be, between the ages of 20 and 70. What does that mean? That means we need to intervene sooner. They catch it between the ages of like three to eight, and commonly in the schools you'll see these kids patched because what ha what's happening is one of the eyes is being shut off. The brain is a very, very uh, amazing entity. And so what it does is the brain says, hey, this eye is not, this eye's not working the way it should, we're gonna shut it down. So you basically have this one eye that's working and one eye that's not, but it, you can't really tell because the child can still see it per se. They're not seeing it as complete monocular where they're, they don't see anything. The brain is very, very amazing. So we need to intervene sooner because we want those, both of those eyes to work. We don't want this monocular vision loss in 20 to 70 year olds. So it's really an interesting um, statistic. And in the next slide, we talk about common childhood eye diseases. And amblyopia, obviously, is the number one there. Um, it is the number one cause of preventable, preventable vision loss in children. So we, as in the school system, as whomever you are out there, we have the ability to change these children's lives. Remember, we talked about one in every four children have a significant vision problem. Maybe not amblyopia per se, but a significant vision problem. But it, amblyopia is an extremely important way that we need to early intervene so that we can prevent that brain from shutting that eye down completely, right? So um, strabismus is where the eyes are not in alignment. Um, and you'll see that the eyes go in different directions. That's more, you can kind of see that in children more so if you're looking at them and their one eye deviates, you'll see that. It's more easily identifiable than our amblyopia is. Obviously our refractory areas, our acuity, whether we see nearsightedness or farsightedness, um, and astigmatisms. So I can't tell you how many kids now that we're picking up here with astigmatism. Um, it's amazing. And these children were not being diagnosed and it was only getting worse for them. So, and of course, um, working on binocular vision disorders, which is becoming more and more common, um, the convergence and sufficiency problems that we're seeing, although the spot doesn't necessarily totally look at that per se, but um, fewer, another statistic, because I'm a statistics gal, some of the fewer than 20% of children receive adequate vision for screening for amblyopia, okay? So that means, think about that in the reverse. 80% of our children are not being screened adequately for this amblyopia. Again, it's shutting an eye down eventually, right? In 20 to 70, our number one cause for monocular vision loss. So this is something that we can do and intervene with quickly. We can help these children and be it a preventable entity. So only 20% of these children are getting accurate screenings for that. Pretty scary statistical stuff. So. I will tell you that um, our nursing staff here is amazing. We work with them quite frequently. Um, the Snellen chart is what we were using before or something similar to that. So, you know, it's one finger over the eye and you're looking forward and telling them what you could see. Did you know that when you were looking at that Snellen chart, you were only picking up nearsightedness, which is being able to see far. You couldn't, weren't picking up if the kid couldn't see in front of them. Where do they take their test? in front of them. We weren't picking up any of the muscle imbalance problems or the amblyopias or any of the stigmatisms that are hidden within the eye. So some of those things were not being picked up typically with our Snellen chart. It's been used in adults and kids for years, right? Um, it can test very simple forms of impairment. However, there, there's been studies that have shown that the Snellen has some difficulty with reliability. Again, you have to have the exact measurement of the distance for the Snellen chart to see how far you're, you're going to see them. So they have to be behind that line. So you put the tape on it, right? This is what we're thinking. Put the tape on it. The child standing there. In our district, we um, look at children ages K, 1, 3, and 6. So in an elementary school, you've got lines of kids going out the door. You've got the screener who's standing there doing the Snellen chart, typically our nurse. You know, the kids be going over the line. You're just trying to get through that line. There was, um, they found that 
children weren't always, they were stepping on the line or before the line, they weren't getting accurate vision per se, and the nurses were just trying to get through it. Um, and also the light illumination has to be the perfect illumination for to, to see the Snellen chart um, as perfect. And those were some things that were problematic in the reliability. And I have um, one of the articles in the back that shows some of the problems with the reliability of the Snellen. Um, but you know, for me, so I'm a PT, right? I'm a physical therapist. My children, the children, I call them my children, but they are, every one of them to me is my children. So the children that I worked with, I had children who had all sorts of disabilities. They were nonverbal, maybe had autism, they had language apraxia, they had all sorts of difficulties. And I would watch them, you know, take them down there, try to do an eye exam. They, they weren't doing an eye exam on these children. We weren't getting any accurate information. And I, as a practitioner, was frustrated um, because I need to know what they can see and what they can't see so that I can help them with their gait, with their balance, with their walking. It also affects how they see what they're doing for school every day. So um, these children, in my opinion, weren't being accounted for in the Snellen chart. So I worked with our uh, managing officer of nursing and she totally agreed that this was not an effective way for us to gather all children's needs for vision. Everybody should have that right. If we're screening one kid, we should screen them all. The childhood English is a second language unless we had a translator. And sometimes you don't even know when you're bringing your vision team in if you have a child who speaks Arabic. You gotta get an Arabic translator. Maybe, maybe not, or you're just kind of guessing, can they see it, can they not? You know, there's some subjectivity to it. Um, so our district felt that when we were looking at going from a Snellen to the spa cleaner, we felt that it was giving more equal access to all children, regardless of whether they had a disability, regardless of whether they had or it's English as a second language learner, we needed to make sure we were capturing all children, not just children who were verbal enough to be able to tell you what they were seeing. Or they spoke English proficiently enough to understand the directions or whether they were too young. Again, the Zambliopias, we weren't picking up anyway, but our children are young, so they may not be able to verbalize what they're seeing or not seeing. So um, that being said, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our district. Um, we are in sunny Florida, and it is beautiful. We are um, a very large district. We are the eighth largest in Florida and um, the 27th largest in the nation. So we have quite a few children. Uh, Pinellas is guide, our screening for vision is guide, guided by our state laws. So we are mandated at this time to see K, one, three, and six, and any new elementary school children to the district. Now. Do I want that to be better? Yes, and I am working on it hard to get funding in, and I'll tell you how I do that, in order to get it so that we can get those pre-K kids that are sitting in our pre-K classrooms here that we want to look for those amblyopias, or maybe our high school kids, because you know, as those high school kids get older and their hormones change, uh, they, you know, their eyes change too. So sometimes when they're older, they're not going, getting the eye care that they need as well. So I'm working on that as my goal for my district in the future. Um, but I wanted to tell you that we screened 30,419 students and we identified 3,369 as failures using the spot screener, okay? So um, the number of students who had follow-up eye care was 61%. So what I'm going to tell you if you hear nothing else from me today, which I hope you hear more, but um, it's that the eye screening is only as good as the follow-up care, right? It's great that you identified the child that they had needs. It's great that you identified that the child needs glasses or needs intervention. But if we don't have a system to make sure that these children are followed up on, it does no good. The screening is only as good as the follow-up care. So I am a huge proponent of that, and I will tell you some of the things that our district did to build in some of the partnerships to work on getting, making sure these kids are getting follow-up care. Um, we had a 61% follow-up rate, which means, would I like that to be a little better? Yes, but um, it's better than some districts, be, and I will explain it to you later, a little bit more about our follow-up care program. So before the, the um, spot screener in 2016, we used nurses to do our Snellen chart. So, um, because the nurses would fail them, and we'd send the letter home, and that would be it. 
But now, because the spot screener is extremely accurate, accurate and has a high reliability rate, and I'll tell you about it because, you know, I am a person that needs to know for me. I'm like this love, love statistics. So I will tell you that I did a little internal study on my own, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I found. Um, we were able to go to a support personnel format. So we have four support personnel that do all of our K1, 3, and 6. They screen all 30,000 students in our district. They go to school to school to school. We do keep those four fairly consistent. We have subs in case we need to, but we keep them consistent for the intra-tester intra reliability and the intra-tester reliability. The spot is very easy to use. It's extremely proficient, but we do want, you need to be trained on it and make sure that you're using it consistently. And those, we have our four support personnel that are doing that. So we have them on a contracted basis. And that also, I will tell you how we save some money there. You can see in 2017 and 18, you can see it was about, you know, 29,006, almost 30,000. Our follow-up rate went down a hair, but not too much. It's still staying around about the 60% there, about give or take some, a few percentage points. So I told you about some of the benefits of electronic screening. So we, again, brought in four support personnel, okay? Um, they're amazing, but they're contracted in. So what we did was we looked at, before we used the spot screener, we had the nurses doing all the schools, and then we had these four spots, these four support personnel who came in, and we had four nurses before doing every single school in our district, K1, 3, and 6, and now we changed it to four support personnel, K1, 3, and 6. And what we did was we found that between the Snellen chart and use of electronic screening, we saved six weeks of screening time. So that six weeks of salary, before it was six weeks of nursing salary, RN salary, but now we put those RNs back in the schools where they need to be. They need to be seeing kids in, in schools every day. They're too valuable for that when we have something that's as reliable as this. Um, and so we have six weeks of screening time that we saved and support personnel salaries before it was RN salary. So um, we do obviously train our force support personnel to be consistent with the screenings. One thing we found was there were less false positives. So you're going to say, huh, how did you know that, Mary Ellen? And I'm going to tell you how I knew that. Um, so we have the Bucks Vision Van. We have an optometrist who is on the Bucks Vision Van. And he, um, I had to do a little bit of, you know, keeping statistics for me because I wanted to know, is the money that Medicaid is spending on this, is it, is it worthwhile? What, what am I, what are, is our district getting for this? You know, first, I knew that we were saving six weeks in screening time, which in and of itself was beneficial. Um, but the less false positive. So what would happen before, if if one of our nurses was questioning whether the student was seeing or not seeing it, you know, they'd fail them. There was some subjectivity to it. Or um, whether some of our kids, they would play around, or some of the kids, you know, just weren't concentrating on the directions and fooling around and didn't do it, so they got failed. So they would get referred to the Bucks Vision Van. We had a significantly less false positive rate, right? Which means less of our children that were showing positive that really weren't positive that were wasting, you know, the time of the, the Bucks Vision Van, time out of class for the kids to go to the, do the Bucks Vision Van. Um, we found far less of those false positives it's because it takes the verbal component out. The child doesn't have to really follow the directions per se. They just have to be able to stare and get their picture taken for a second of their eyes. So um, the false negatives, I will never know, right? I will never know how many kids I missed because we can't know that. And that's disheartening. Um, so I know our reliability rate with the spot screener in conjunction with getting the optometrist re-screen, retesting with their equipment on, their, on board their van, which is huge and it has all sorts of equipment on it, was about at 98%. So I know it's a very reliable entity. Um, so it's time efficient, less false positive, and we could train support personnel versus um, our RNs, which we, we really do need in our schools. We can have children as English as a second language learners. We can make sure that we're looking at them. And all children with disabilities, they deserve to have their eyes screened. They deserve to be able to see. Um, so those are things, obviously we're looking at eye alignment and risk problems. You know, even normal developing children are the ones who are getting the amblyopias, 
And we need to solve that. We need to early intervene because the faster we intervene, the less the chance that brain is going to say, hey, that eye is not working. We're going to shut it off. So um, it's being a part of the conversation for follow-up care is an important entity for me because it's such a pro. So before, our nurses were busy screening, right? They had less time for follow-up because they were busy screening. Now we have put more nurses in our more nurses in our schools and we'll talk about what I ask the nurses to do because I do still ask them to be a part of this follow-up care um, and that's where I think that they can help the most in our in the way our district runs things so so cost versus savings so I purchased three spot trainers and portable ink with um, the ink printer it was actually a wireless printer um, because they, they could take a printer to every school it's a small one portable wireless it connects to all the different printers in our all our schools um, and the our Department of Health saw such good results here that they are also purchased too sometimes they'll come in if we're you know some one of our screeners are out they'll come in and help us occasionally um, but the total cost of the district at one time was about thirty four thousand dollars think about the fact that I say support personnel even just our support personnel never mind the four weeks of the RN salary but Four weeks of contracted personnel, we saved eighteen thousand dollars and fifty cents. Uh, eighteen thousand dollars, about for four support personnel's worth of salary per year. Thereabout. Multiply that times two. There's your district savings in just two years. I mean, to me, it's kind of a no-brainer. You you can save money, be more efficient, more effective, and help children. And make sure that all children are accounted for, not just certain children. Um, so I'm also going to tell you about Medicaid because you're wondering, well, that's great. You sound wonderful and all, Mary Ellen, but you know, you're the Medicaid coordinator. What does that have to do with all of this? And I'm going to tell you. Um, so our managing officer of nursing and myself got together and we were both in agreement that the current way of vision screening was inefficient, ineffective. Um, not getting what we needed for total eye care for our district. We wanted all children to be looked at for vision screenings. So Medicaid up, would have to put the money up front because we wouldn't have had that cost savings of the six weeks, which we actually didn't know that how much time it would save us anyway before when we were initially purchasing the screeners. So Medicaid in our district is part of um, Pinellas County participates in what we call the Certified School Match Program. If any of your districts are not part of it, they really need to look into it. It is a fabulous entity. It's easy. Um, my providers are amazing. We bill physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, nursing, um, psychology, social work, and we do bill specialized transportation on the days the children go to and from school that receive a specialized service, one of those services at school. So we bill all of those entities. Our district does pretty well. Um, so last year, between our fee-for-service billing and what we call our admin claiming side, which is our other side, we did about 5.1 million. And that does help our district significantly. Now, our nursing fee-for-service, we bill for procedures that are done, tube feeding, um, some of the diabetic care that goes on, any sort of injection care that they may need medication administration, those kinds of things, catheterization. Um, we build $123,416 in nursing services. Now we were reimbursed $75,417.04. So you say, well, why were you reimbursed that amount? Well, the government sets what we call our federal share, which is every year it kind of varies depending on what the federal government deems is our share. So we build that amount, that's what we got back in 2017-18 but this is about what we've been doing thereabouts. so what we did was we took our nursing managing officer and myself said let's take thirty four thousand dollars put that aside and pay that one-time cost for those spot screeners and then we didn't know that we would actually be saving money in contracted costs for support personnel which in two years would actually pay for itself but we did do that so that's kind of how medicaid gets involved um we are, it's very important that Medicaid helps so many people in our district. I can't tell you the dollars that come in helps us bring resources back to children. 
I knew that our vision program needed to be strengthened so that we could do better for children. And Medicaid was, I'm, I'm proud that Medicaid was a part of that for our district. It was allowed us to bring in some of the revenue to be able to upscale these testing, the, the vision spot screen and do the electronic screening for our children because they need it. We need to help these children be successful. They are our future. So, you know, it's amazing to me. People say, well, you know, putting money in, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, be, care be careful. Look at the next child you're looking at. They could be near your next heart surgeon, your next brain surgeon, your next lawyer, your next teacher, your next hairdresser, your next whomever you want to believe. We have to be able to make sure that these children are taken care of. They're well and healthy mentally and physically and that they are educated properly so that they can be our future. You know, I know I get on my little soapbox, but I had to do it. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some case studies. So these studies, and they're really not studies, they're really anecdotals, um, and they are amazing to me, and they are true stories. They will bring absolute shiver, shivers to your spine. Um, these are just a few things that have happened to us in the last two years here in Pinellas using uh, Vision Spot electronic screening. Um, the first one, we had a child. She was in North County. Um, and she was normal developing, appeared to be normal developing, happy, healthy, first grader. She was, uh, in our North County, it's more our affluent area. Um, she had been at the physician actually a couple of weeks before. I knew that because her parents told me later. And at the physician's office, she had her yearly screening. They did the Snellen chart and the typical ophthalmoscope. Everything was great, perfectly fine. She was part of our normal screening for every child, K1, 3, 6. Our vision team came in with a spot and did the spot screener. I took the picture of the eye. Um, now, we usually send the picture of the eye home so the parent could see if the, parent, if the child failed or, or didn't fail they, or there was something wrong and we put on there um, that the child failed, need follow-up care, and we'll talk about that. I am more intervening in follow-up care a little bit later. But this child, we took the spot and the vision team called, again, their support personnel, um, called myself, managing officer of nursing, and another RN who was with us, and sent us a copy of what was seen. It was uh, an atypical looking white spot on the screen. Now, could it have been an artifact? Potentially, but they did it twice and it came back the same. So I call, we called the parent right away, all three of us, and we said, you know, um, can we, we have to get permission to talk to the physician. They have to give us relief. So we said, can we talk to your physician and we'd really like you to get some follow-up. You know, we don't know what it is. It could just be an artifact on there. We didn't want to scare the parent, although it was pretty apparent that there was something there that was not normal. So um, anyway, they, they call, we called the doctor. We sent it over to them. I hadn't heard back in a while, so we were going through our normal routines weeks later, and I got a phone call from the mother, and she was crying. And I didn't know exactly what to make of it at the time, and she said, I just wanted to thank you. Thank you for bringing in this screener because, you know, it caught a tumor in my child's eye. And I leave you with a pregnant pause there because a, this child had been at the position two weeks earlier, and has normal developing, everything seemed fine. She wasn't having headaches. She wasn't seeing nothing. She wasn't not seeing double. She wasn't seeing, there was nothing. But apparently um, they did have follow-up care um, through the, at Miami Institute. There's an eye institute there. Um, and they said that before the, the old cameras used to pick up tumors on children with, with, it would show up kind of as a white spot in the film. But now with the red eye and the electronic component of cameras, that's being taken away. So the spot screener did pick up. Now, of course, I did not diagnose. My managing officer did not diagnose. We just said that something was atypical. We'd like to bring it to your physician's attention. And of course, they were then to follow up and did the MRI and found the, the tumor. But um, it's pretty powerful when a mother is crying and thanking you for saving her life. So I tell everybody, my providers who are billing, because they say it's a lot of, you know, I got a bill, I got to do this. I was like, yeah, but you saved somebody's life. You know, I mean, that to me is so immeasurable. Um, 
The next one is kind of another one that will bring chills to your spine. And this one is mind blowing that in 2000, the time of 17, 18 school year, it's mind blowing that this could happen. But we had a, a, an adorable little kindergartner and the, the way our vision team rotates schools, she was kind of at the end of the vision rotation. So she was later in the year, unfortunately. By that time, the child was already a retainee in kindergarten. She had had what we call a problem solving worksheet. Uh, she had what we call tier two interventions, small group interventions. She had behaviors because she was getting frustrated. So she had what we call a PBIP. We academically and threw everything at this child we could throw at her, right? We gave her all of the resources, everything we could do. So in comes a spot screener and it didn't read at all. It just didn't read. And it read on every other child and it wouldn't read on her. They did it a couple times. The team called again, myself and the managing officer of nursing. And she and I called the parent and said, you know, we'd really like her to get some follow-up care with this. You know, we don't know what it means. We just know that it's not reading and that's not, you know, typical of what's going on with the spot screener. So the parent says, I don't have insurance. I lost my job, I'm a single mother, I don't have Medicaid, um, I just got into a car accident, I don't even really have a car. And I was like, okay, now this is where the Medicaid coordinator says, okay, got this. So I called our Bucks Vision Band, who um, again was is the Glazer Foundation and our Glazer family here, it's a, the Bucks organization, our Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Glazer Foundation has purchased this van and allows us and a couple of other counties to use this. And it's been such a blessing. You can merge with a community resource, um, such as a big sports team that would be able to sponsor something like this. It is immeasurable how much help it can give. Um, anyway, we were, I called the Bucks Vision Van and I said, listen, can, can you see this child, even though this child, Bucks Vision Van was not at her school? She said, sure. So I called the social worker and I said, let's pick up the, can, let's go get the parent and the child and we'll bring them to the Bucks Vision Van. And so the child can be seen. Okay, we did that. Social worker, myself, brought her there. Now we waited outside because of HIPAA guidelines, all the children were being kind of, you know, sauntered through the van. So we didn't want, you know, we couldn't be a part of it because of HIPAA. So we waited outside and about 30 minutes later, the optometrist walks out with the child, hand held, he was holding her hand and she had big thick Coke bottle glasses on. Apparently she was legally blind, legally blind. We drew everything we could at her academically. We gave her interventions. We gave her behavior plans. We gave her academic plans. We threw small group instruction. We gave her another teacher. She couldn't see couldn't see. Now here's the part that's shivering. So you may cry, it's okay, you can bring up some tissues out. But she uh she five she was six at that point, came to her mom and she said, Mom, you're she was crying. The little girl was crying. She said, You're so pretty. I've never really seen your face. Such a powerful moment for me. Unbelievable. I mean I was crying, everybody's crying it you know, and it was like she saw for the first time. She's like, wow, those birds and, and the trees. Now, this child has always seen this way. So you can say, how could she have gotten away with this for this long? This child could see objects and could see things. So she wasn't bumping into things. She wasn't falling and she didn't know she couldn't see. She couldn't verbalize to you that that was any different because that's all she ever knew. So now they say, well, she, fit, she didn't get any of the letters right. This child is smart. She's she remembered the ABC songs from preschool and she knew that those were what they called letters. So every time the teacher would show her a letter, she would be like, oh, A, C, D, E, F. Occasionally she'd get it right, right? Cause just by random selection. So that girl knew that that song meant a letter, but she couldn't really see the letters, but she knew that that's what they were asking her to do. But of course she was starting with behavior. She was frustrated. She couldn't do what they wanted her to do. Um, I'm just going to tell you two more quick stories um, because I think that the stories and the anecdotes really optimize to you what what it means, right? Because I can throw all the statistics, I can do all that to you, but what does it mean for children? What does it mean for individual children that makes a difference? Those two children, we change their lives, clearly. 
And the next child is, is a, as well. She um, was a third grader coming in from um, another country. She didn't speak any English. They only spoke Arabic, she and the parents. We didn't have any data from the country she was coming from. So we put her in a general education classroom because we didn't know any different. And during that time, the teacher's like, you know what, there's something wrong with this child. Even children of English as a second language learner, follow directions, do things. She's like, I think she's ESE. I think she needs some, some more support. So, okay. I think she might need a special classroom. It's really what the teacher said. So we did the tier two interventions, got her to tier three and said, okay, let's open up for evaluation. So we opened up for all our evaluations, including psychological evaluation. So in order for us to go to an IEP, they need to have a vision and a hearing screening. So again, this child is Arabic. She wasn't really following directions. Uh, we weren't gonna get a snail and chart on her. The parents didn't have a doctor yet. Um, what else could go wrong here, right? She's just gonna sit in this classroom and not get anything until we get these things done. So I said, let's bring in the spot screener and see what we can do. So we brought in the spot screener. Sure enough, the child had some sort of muscle problem where she required prism glasses. Um, she was seeing like double and triple. Um, the optometrist said, again, we put her on, we got her to the Bucks Vision van and they had to make special prism glasses for her. And then during our hearing screening, which again, we do here, um, we have a full audiology services here and she failed that too. So this, we had to get her hearing aids. We had we worked through our Sonoma here, which is a local organization that was helping us get some um, hearing aids for her because again, they didn't have any money. They didn't have any insurance. Um, so we got her the prison glasses and the hearing aids. Well, we still have this, this evaluations open, so we still have to complete them. So I, if I'm in person, I'm much better because I could see and tell your faces, but I'll give you a wild, wild guess what this child's IQ was. We, we checked her IQ anyway, because we were already open for her. This was after she received her glasses and her hearing aids. I'll give you a second. You can shout out loud to yourselves or whatever you want to do, but I'll give you a second. So her IQ was 119, 119, high normal. This child was completely normal, but of course she wasn't following the teacher's directions. She couldn't see, she couldn't hear, and she didn't understand a word of English. Yet we were sitting there saying, oh, or somebody was sitting there saying she belongs in a special class because you know she can't do things. No, she couldn't see, she couldn't hear, and she didn't understand English. So as a follow-up for you, this child, just so you know, that the parents were diligent. They went and got um, English as well on the outside for them, some English help for the whole family. Um, but in a year's time, she was almost at grade level after not having intervention for a long time. The parents didn't even know she had this. So they just called it, she was special but she just needed someone to identify her need. And the last one I'm gonna tell you about um, really bothers me. It, it ticks me off and whether you're a teacher or a nurse or a physical therapist or a parent or anyone else, the non-testable child, I, it, it was so irritating to me. Um, you know, we had kids that were nonverbal. Well, they're just non-testable. We just can't test their vision. I'm like, really? Because just because they're nonverbal doesn't mean that we don't give them the right to be able to see. You know, it was very bothersome to me. I was in a classroom of a child who was in seventh grade in our district. Okay, so before the spot screeners came in, in check, she was had had the old Snellen chart. And I was in the classroom again. She was a nonverbal child, but the mother the teacher, she had the paper like up to her face and she was squinting. I mean, it was very clear that the child couldn't see. And I said to the teacher, I think the child can't see. And she's like, yeah, I know. She's like, I've referred her to the nurse, but so I go up to the nurse's office. She was screened in K, one, three, and six. You want to know what the results were? Non-testable, 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 non-testable. That is not acceptable for me. That is not acceptable it is not acceptable that that child was considered a non-testable child for vision. So I brought the spot screener in, I had them test her and sure enough, she needed glasses. So that whole time they told her she was, you know, she's nonverbal, so she doesn't know what's going on. Well, doesn't mean she couldn't see, doesn't mean she couldn't follow directions better if she could learn better if she knew she could see. So think of all those years lost for that child because she couldn't see, she couldn't, <laughs> couldn't see just because she couldn't talk doesn't mean she couldn't see and we ha should give her that right to be able to see 
So I told you my screening stories. I won't get off my little soapbox there, but I wanted to make sure you knew, um, you know, the non-testable child, that, that bothers me. It's not okay. So educational benefits, because again, there's teachers out there and we're saying, you know, and again, that teacher knew that there was something wrong with that child as well. And the nurse did too, but they didn't have the resources to be able to do what they needed to do for that child. We didn't have an electronic screener that could do what they what it can do for this child. And now we do, and, and we're making differences every day. Um, the educational benefits. So I don't know if you guys have ever been to a vision screening in a school, but holy camoly. So you've got K1, 3, and 6. We have some 800 students in our district in one elementary usually. So it's about, you know, 100, 300 kids that are getting screened in a day. You know, they're lining up that poor, before it was the RNs, the poor RNs with their little tape and the thing taped to the wall. They're going through, the fatigue factor for that nurse was exhausting. But also the this classroom, how long they were out of the classroom to get those screenings, because sometimes they'd have to re-ask them, they'd have to recheck them. Should they fail them? Don't they fail them? They send them a note home. Well, now there's less time out of the classroom. They come in, they get the spot, it's in the correct illumination, they, they do what they need to do, take a picture, kid's done. We will print out their, I put it in a folder, give it to them to take home, quick. Um, less resources spent on kids. Think about those two kids, the one kindergartner that I told you that was legally blind, all those resources, all the extra teachers, extra support we gave that child, she didn't need it, she needed to be able to see. <laughs> And the other child who had the, the prisms and the hearing, again, we gave her lots of other interventions and we even thought about another classroom setting for her, but the resources that are spent that should be spent on getting these kids the right screening so we know what's wrong so that we can help them. Um, and of course, the early intervention, the earlier we intervene with these kids, the more they're gonna learn, the more they're gonna know, the more we're gonna be able to help them. So, and if they can't see or they can't hear, we need to know so we can give them accommodations so that they can be successful. Um, so I'll quickly tell you about our follow-up care. I promise I'm almost done. I hope it's not too boring. I'm trying to be as exciting as possible. It's kind of difficult, I will tell you, to just do it to a phone without any feedback. So hopefully someone says the feedback is okay. Um, so uh, registered nurses at our school, they follow up with one letter that is sent to the parent. And we do document that in our, um, in our system. Um, so we, the parents are getting letters that are sent to home and we document it in our student data system. So we know that the first letter has been sent. If there's no response by the parent, we send another letter. And then if there's thirdly, if there's no response, um, we call the guardian because we wanna make sure that we're getting them follow-up care. If they can't ha don't have the means to be able to do it, if there's financial restrictions and they can't go to a doctor, we'll try to get them through the Bucks Vision Van. Also, I told you that Medicaid pays for the National Association of Nurses. All of our RNs in our district are part of the National Association of Nurses, and that allows us to participate in a vision voucher program. So it's called the VSP vouchers, which means that every nurse who participates gets so many vision vouchers. So we, I, Medicaid pays for all of their association of nursing dues so that we can get the vision voucher so that I can use it for children who don't have um, the means and the income to be able to do it. If the child is Medicaid, I will follow up, um, try to find out who the providers are in the area that, the, that will take their insurance. Um, again, we partner up with the Bucks Vision Van, which is an amazing thing. They will give them a free eye exam and free pair of glasses. Um, so those are kind of our follow up. And I am, we are strict about making sure we do all of that to make sure that that happens, that the follow-up care is the most important part of the screening. Again, I don't care how you screen, but and if the kid fails, if you don't have any follow-up care, it doesn't make any difference. So, um, so one last, a couple last things, and then we're almost done. So free care, what does that mean? So free care was something that was looked at by the Obama administration, um, and it was a memorandum put out by what we call the CMS. So that's the governing body over Medicaid and Medicare. What, CM, what CMS interpreted that free care to mean, and I'm gonna put it pretty simply because it's easier to understand. If you have two children coming down to the nurses to get asthma medication, right? They're getting breathing treatments for asthma. One child has an IEP and has ESB and they are Medicaid eligible. The other child is still has a diagnosis of asthma and they're Medicaid eligible, but are not what we call ESE. So, or exceptional student education. They don't have an IEP. As of now, according to the Certified School Match Program, only the child with the IEP is billable. 
So what this Free Care Act interpretation said is, no, that's not right. You should be able to bill for both of those children if they both are Medicaid eligible and we both have parental consent and they're both receiving a medical service at school. So how does that work? On the federal level, they've already interpreted it. Now it comes down to the state level. Um, each state has to open up their state amendment um, that governs Medicaid to make the changes to kind of accommodate how those rules will be followed, what the, ramif what the ramifications are, what we need to do as far as following compliance standards. So all of that is being worked out. Massachusetts has already done this. So if Massachusetts is online, way to go. Um, we are still working on it here in Florida, but I'm hoping that it'll be here sooner rather than later. Um, I am a big proponent and have been through the legislature to talk about right now, our screenings, our vision screenings are not billable in Florida. So I am telling them if we, the children who fail should be billable. And I liken it to like a colonoscopy. And I say that because if you go in for a colonoscopy, it's a screening. You don't really know, is there gonna be something there or isn't there, right? So when you go in and the screening is fine, you're billed under just a screening. It just is kind of a screening, but if they find something, it's considered diagnostic. So I'm fighting through the legislature here in Florida to say, if we find something wrong with this child's eye, if they fail, it should be a diagnostic, meaning they should need follow-up care. We put all of this energy and things into follow-up care for these children. It should be a billable service because we found something that was not um, okay with their vision. It was a failure. So that needed um, medical help and follow-up. So that's my goal. I'm working really hard with our legislature um, to be able to do that. And if we can do that, then we can put more money back into our I program to see how we can just kind of put this money that we are we can generate back into our I program to make it more successful. Buy the spot screeners, look at all of these things. So um, finally, you know, eyes are the windows of the soul. So I I believe that all of our um, children are amazing. They are our future, like I said before. They are who we need them to be and who we want them to be for our future. Our future as well as their future. And I think that we need to be able to support them. Early intervention, vision screening, getting them the help they need, preventing that monocular vision loss, preventing, you know, looking at getting them their glasses faster so they can absorb academic material faster. They're not getting headaches. They're not getting all of these things. We need to be and make them as successful as possible. And not just not just our, our normal developing children, but also our children with disabilities that can't necessarily um, articulate the same way. We need to give everybody an equal fair shot at vision, improving vision and vision services. And our day is so busy and everything's crazy and life is crazy and, and, and we just need to say that, you know what, this is a priority. In our district, I've made it a priority. And I'm not here because I want you necessarily, you know, to look at the vision spot screener, but I want you to understand that it has helped our district significantly. It has helped us with efficiency, effectiveness. It has helped us with, with getting children help. Um, and it has been a top, you know, time saver and help us so much. So I, um, I thank you for giving me the time to be able to talk. I'm passionate about it because I, I want to help children. And I really do feel that the spot screener has made a huge difference in our district. So I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I'm going to ask you to leave your resources uh, slide up um, that you have. Oh, sorry. In case, so Mary Ellen's got some resources here um, from uh, things that she spoke of in her presentation. And we're going to leave this up for a few minutes in case anyone wants to take these resources down. Um, but again, thanks, Mary Ellen, for taking the time to present this, this, this terrific information. I know that you said uh, to me earlier that you're used to giving these presentations in person, so doing it over the phone is a little bit of a different interaction. We really appreciate having you here, especially on School Nurses Day, um, which is an important day for all of our nurses. It's an important day for us at School Health, and so we're really happy to have you and, and to be able to bring this, um, this information to the nurses that we have. I wanted to mention a couple of things, and then I want to be able to get to a few questions, and I know that we're getting short on time, um, but uh, Mary Ellen had mentioned, and of course, um, if you're following School Health on Facebook, if you're subscribed to our emails, you'll know that we have been celebrating uh, National Nurses Week all week long. We have been celebrating uh, School Nurse Day today. 
we're having a, uh, a, a contest with prizes and giveaways where we encourage our nurses to share their story about a time a student has positively influenced them. And if you've had a chance to look at our Facebook page or our Twitter page and read some of these stories, they are absolutely touching. Um, they're, they're fantastic stories about significant interactions that nurses are having with uh, students that are out there. So I would encourage people if they're not on uh, School Health Facebook, go and check it out. Um, there's there's a lot of, of great stories that are there. And if you'd like to share your story with us, we'd love to have it. A um, uh, bit of information here about the Spot Vision Screener. Um, we are offering um, promotional savings of up to $2,425 when you trade in an old vision screener toward a Spot Vision Screener. In addition, you can also get a five-year Partners in Care warranty at no charge, and this is an offer that we're, we're having exclusively through School Health. Um, we're doing it in partnership with Welsh Allen, and this is available for anybody who would like to take advantage of it now. It's, it's important, and especially this five-year Partners in Care warranty is important because it gives you a complimentary loaner that's shipped overnight. Imagine if you're in the scenario that that Mary Ellen spoke of where you're in the middle of screening 300 kids and you drop your screener. Well, they're going to overnight you a loaner at no charge. Um, they're going to pay for the parts and labor and the shipping in full. Um, this warranty does cover dropping a screener. It happens. Um, and, and it also offers a replacement battery, accidental damage, and remote technical support. So this is, this is really some good benefit uh, for purchasing a spot vision screener right now. Um, let me get to a couple of questions that we've got real quickly here. Um, I've got a nurse, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if she's a nurse. I've got an attendee named Karen who asks, uh, Mary Ellen, if uh, Florida requires vision screening to report an acuity uh, measurement, and if so, how do you address that in using the spot vision screener? So it, it, it does um, report, we do report to the Department of Health, and it does give you a basic acuity screening on there. So it, it, it gives you everything that you need. We, we report it to the Department of Health. We have all the statistics that are given, and we have to report that um, every quarter what we've done with our screenings. And then we have to have an end of the year report, which includes all of the acuity as well as all of our who screens, how many screens, and what percentage of follow-up we have. All of that is reported to the state. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question you, you had mentioned earlier, and it, it may be a clarification, but having uh, Medicaid pay for, was it an NASN membership so that nurses yep. can access VSP vouchers? Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how that happens? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, the again, medic nurses generate dollars through their billing process, and so um, we, I, my district, I'm very, very lucky in that I can use that programmatic money, putting back towards the programs of like nurses or OTPT or speech, so we can bring in um, more PDs. We do things like that to help in, in enhance the um, the program. So we get 50% of everything that's generated. So the managing officer of nursing and I said, well, you know, our one of our big goals is this is vision, preventative vision loss and looking at vision and how we can help students. We knew about the VSP voucher. So if we, I have Medicaid, the nurses, managing officer of nursing gives me the list of RNs and we pay for RNs, National Association of Nursing. And, and doing that, we get I can't remember how many per RN we get back for vision vouchers. And then I can give them to students to be able to get free eye care in the in the area. They give them places to go in our district and we they can go to Targets and you know Walmarts or wherever and these children get a free eye exam and free pair of glasses. So by paying for the National Association of Nursing membership, it gives them P D, it gives them more things towards helping students in the schools, but it also gives us this vision voucher and it, for free, and it allows us to give um, vision care back to children. Okay, thank you. Is that helpful? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much. Um, a question about, you mentioned the child with the, the tumor on their eye. When you were looking at the resorts, uh, results from the spot, 
did it show abnormal results or was it just the fact that there was a white area seen on the picture? It said, it said failed. It was a big failure and it, there was something there. Um, obviously, I am not a diagnostician. I do not pretend to be and neither do our nurses. We just knew that it failed and there was something unusual about that. And we circled it, failed, circled the failure. Again, we contact the parent because in our district, we can't talk to a physician without um, written approval from the parent. So they did that and then we sent it to the physician and, and they followed up and then the parent followed up as well. And that's how that was, you know, obviously it was a diagnostic down the road a little bit, but we, it, come up, it came up as a failure and then a big spot that was, you, you couldn't have, it was something abnormal. I mean, I didn't know it was a tumor per se, but I knew it was something not right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, looks like we are running low on time. I, I see that we do have questions that we haven't been able to get to. We will uh, reach out to each of you who has asked a question directly uh, with an answer um, for your question. And uh, just want to remind everybody that we are recording today's uh, presentation. Uh, you will receive an email in the next few days um, with a link to the recorded presentation, uh, as well as your certificate for attending today. Um, thank you for your time and happy School Nurses Day. Thanks, everyone. Happy School Nurses Day!